Hello, Fido. Hello. Question one. Human in Greek language is called anthropos, which is a compound word from ancient Greek words ano and throsko, and it means the one who looks up to God. This shows us that human is absolutely a transcendental being. We can say that in general is observed a denial of this. Are we finally smarter from the ancient world? Have we really evolved from the ancient years until now? Or have we reversed back then to brutal prehistoric years? So as I understand the question, the word human connotes looking up in its derivation. And you're asking, have we transcended? Have we moved more in that direction of, of looking up or have we gone backwards in time? Well, I, I think I, I like the idea of, of human being looking up to quote unquote God, because I think that art is about humans striving to understand their environment and to, uh, you know, become more perfect and, and seek the spiritual like architecture in the Gothic era, trying to, you know, reach upward and, and be ornate in this beautiful way. And so, uh, as I understand the question, we as artists are often going deep within and looking for some spiritually transformative expression. Are we as a society perfecting that expression and moving along with the depth of art and the artist? Or, as you say, have we devolved to being more primitive creatures of violence and selfish motives. And I, I think probably you have both strands happening simultaneously, but we certainly have not evolved out of our baser instincts. Okay, question two. We live in a very strange and nihilistic period that political ideologies and parties have collapsed worldwide. When something collapses, something else will replace it. What do you think that will be? Hmm, well, I certainly am enjoying watching it collapse on some level and knowing that it will have to be replaced by something newer. And the question is, will, will we learn the lessons that are inherent in the collapse and forge something more perfect in the future, or will we go into another dark age. You know, you have your dark ages, your enlightenments, your times of philosophical expression and expansion. And I firmly believe that it's going to have to get a lot worse on some level before it can get better. What will it evolve into? I couldn't possibly know, but I know some friends and family members of mine are distraught by the conditions in the world and the seeming discord Whereas I also am moved by that, I do believe we're playing a long game here and that it could be multiple decades, hundreds of years, but we're going into an interesting new paradigm shift. So we'll see what happens. Question three. Is our life actually a force game, a continuous effort to prove that we deserve to live in a totally competitive and schizoid environment? In Infernal, you call us to escape from that. Maximus the Confessor, 590 to 662, had said that people who escape from the world don't deny it, but they sanctify it, having a high sense of sociability. It is, it's a pure and a very deep social act. Is this able to happen without him? Him, capitalized. Is, is it able to happen without God? Have you succeeded in escaping from it? I don't think I've succeeded in escaping from anything, but as a, a writer and someone who, you know, is looking at philosophy, I do think that one is often trying to ask myself the question of where I fall in this game, quote unquote, of life and how to perfect my own experience and, and expression a, as a, a being here in the music, in the lyrics, I'm certainly going through asking a lot of the questions of what happens when the society, the civilization break down, be that either physical uh, world um, climate breaking down, be that society changes 
causing a breakdown, be that the infighting between nations and borders and whatnot. So I do think that we're square in the middle of that struggle, and it's the same struggle that we've been in for you know thousands of years. Question four. <clears throat> Modern civilization born under rationalism. Communism defied, defined human as a product machine, and capitalism just added the consumer's trait in his id, trying to leave God out of the story. <clears throat> homo sapiens has turned into homo economicus. Has the time come to overcome this and look for a spiritual change? Well, I don't know if the time has come, but certainly we have swung into the so-called homo economist full stop. You can clearly see that around the world in our commerce and our politics. However, I don't know that the solution or the natural counterbalance to that would be super religiosity because then you then you get to fundamentalism and you get to you know religious wars but is the solution as communism would have us say that to take you know god out of the process completely and that i i couldn't answer i i do know that whereas i'm not a religious person i do often think about the spiritual possibilities and and ask myself questions as if it's an existential consideration. So I don't think that we have taken God out in a successful way. We've, we've certainly made it inconvenient to have God in our discussions a lot of the time, unless it's to castigate or create discord. It would be nice to synthesize all of these things together so that we would have spiritual undercurrent infusing our questions of economy and our place in life and the species we wish to evolve into. Question five. <clears throat> if a man will try to cut a rose and smell it, thorns will hurt him. On the other hand, ants are able to climb through thorns and get inside the rose. Should we first humiliate ourselves and get rid of arrogance and overweening so as to live inside the rose? Well... We spend a lot of time cutting things down and getting burned by the ramifications that we may not have thought of. So there does seem to be another way to approach problems that we as a species haven't really spent a lot of time working towards. We, we definitely use the blunt instrument versus the careful deliberations and considerations much of the time. So the ants probably have uh, uh, something to teach us. But that's clear from the beginning anyway. Question six. A few years ago, we had an interview with Ken Hensley from Uriah Heep. When he was talking about his faith in Jesus Christ, he pointed out that his music is inspired by him. Does this happen to you? Is my music inspired by Jesus Christ? I would not say that my music is inspired by Jesus Christ, although... Certainly the character of Jesus Christ is a powerful archetype. I certainly have had some music where I've examined the Gnostic Gospels and looked for the Jesus Christ that exists before the New Testament. But is that a major consideration of my work? I would not say that that's a major consideration of my work. However, I do think that philosophical questions of humanity and morality and where quote-unquote evil exists in the world or man's lesser instincts, I certainly will ruminate over some of those aspects of life quite a lot in my music. But I would not say that I'm trying to present my work through any particular philosophy or philosophical religion or a discipline. Question 7. The kingdom of God is within you, Luke 17. You say we came down from the stars, like Joni Mitchell has once said in the Woodstock song. And of course, we totally agree with you. Therefore, you will agree that we always remember the beautiful moments in our life. These moments that the night becomes a day, these moments that will accompany us, the time will close our eyes and be eternal, just like the stars. So, does eternity, kingdom of God, related mainly with beautifulness and not just with moral good and good in law? 
Is your life beautiful, Xavier? Well, absolutely. I think we are part and parcel of the fabric of the universe. There's no separation between our atomic structure and that of the sun or outer planets or other stars in the universe, according to my understanding. So I think when I'm singing We Came Down From The Stars, it's, it's both literal as well as metaphoric, meaning we have come from the great lineage of the universe, the progression from wherever, whatever first came to the expression of our life on this earth. And is it beautiful? Am I beautiful? I certainly am beautiful. We certainly are beautiful. So I would say that that would be the case. Question eight. I'm the good shepherd, John 10. In the order of protection one, you mentioned the good shepherd. Unfortunately, often the spider sits comfortably on our web, cast out and cold, while we are the flies that willingly fall into the trap of her radial screens and virtual realities. Eventually, are we just cheap that the Good Shepherd comes and rescues, or ignorant people that do not know the way to be rescued? Well, I think that the shepherd isn't always necessarily for our own good. You know, we we are very often shepherded by well-meaning characters, but in the particular case of of the Order of Protection 1, that shepherd is kind of protecting the sheep for their meat and for what they have to provide. So, yes, we often want to run into the spider's web, but who will rescue us? I don't know that any outside force is ultimately going to be able to rescue us, so be careful which shepherds you put your faith in, I would say. Question 9. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. Mark 13. What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray? Test you enter into temptation? Lest you enter into temptation? The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew 26. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Matthew 24. Wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Ephesians 5. In many parts in your album, you emphasize the importance of staying awake, just like the Bible. Can we say that this is your personal call to the world by feeling that the end of days approach? Well, I I definitely think that that's an interesting question and an interesting observation of my work. Do I say to myself and my audience, stay awake, wake up? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is it because the end of days approaches? I wouldn't say that I have that sense, but when I think of the end of days, I think there are many times where we have an end of days, and that is a paradigm shift. So are we experiencing a shift into a new form of consciousness and social contract? It's certainly possible. But I also think that I'm I'm thinking about being awake in a personal way sense. I mean, I know that in recovery, people in the 12 steps groups around the world, we're always at different places. Like my revelation might not link with someone else's. I might suddenly one day wake up and realize that I don't have to pursue a certain kind of behavior or a a certain kind of mindset. Whereas I look around me and other people are deep within their addictions or the way they think. So I definitely advocate for waking up, and that's, a, I believe, a personal situation, what it will mean for the world in general, and if it's to stave off a purported end time, I, I couldn't tell you. But definitely, I love that metaphor of people needing to take responsibility for who they are. I mean, the choice that we have in life is to choose who we want to be so that the outside world will respond to us most effectively without the impediments that we put before people and before ourselves. Do you think that humanity is finally so morally free that can deny real freedom? He also said, defeating morality, which distinguishes people from good and bad, shakes the arrogance of humanism. Who believes that with ethics he can eliminate evil from the world. So is the, so is the difference lies in no matter how bad or good you are to manage to love or to be loved by your fellow humans. 
Well, I would say that in terms of the concept of good and evil and morality, it's certainly open to interpretation. As a secular person, I think it's possible to have morality and justice without necessarily a religious point of view. And I do think that the human animal has an instinctual sense of ethics and morality in in many regards, whereas we also have an instinctual sense of quote-unquote evil that would want us to get ahead in the world, get someone else's property because we covet it. But in terms of the concept of good and evil, I think that it is a perfection that we strive for individually. And just like evolution perfects our abilities and each generation, people have new mathematical capacity, people understand technology more easily than their previous generation of people. We may have some epigenetic transmission of morality. I mean, you look around and you see the quote-unquote woke culture, people of younger generations are offended by things that people of the older generations would not really think about, and there's a little bit of a disconnect in that regard, but that could be the evolution from generations working. So I think it's an interesting question about morality and, and how it changes, but I'm not sure that I subscribe to the idea that we must have a maker, an anthropomorphized maker to give us the definition of morality and values. You're constantly referring to a game in your album. Is it Das Glas Berlin Spiel by Hermann Hesse that you refer to? I would say no, that it's not. I'm not familiar with that Hesse book. It's probably more likely to be Nicholas Gogol or Kafka or some of the other man trapped in the game slash bureaucracy that has inspired me in that regard. I was definitely quite influenced by Nicholas Gogol's Dead Souls, as well as Franz Kafka's The Trial when I was young and seeking to read my intellectual slate of books that would make me a whole thinker. Question number 12. We're impressed by the fact that watching some live videos on the internet, we observe that in some way, Fido are moving and somehow choreographing subconsciously and subtly the pieces they interpret, just like prophesied by David in his Psalm number 150. Do you think that your trilogy was spontaneously captured with a prophetic kind of writing? I do think that it was captured unconsciously, for sure. And my sister used to tell me that there were things within it as she was listening to the demos, she said, yeah, this, this is happening right now. You're not really writing about a fictional thing. And there were signs along the way where things were getting a little close for comfort. So I probably, like many, many, many artists at this point in our life, was just observing what was around me and, and picking up on the, the vibes out in the world. It's sad to see how much This dystopian trilogy that I undertook is now more just historical footnotes rather than science fiction or or speculative fiction. Question number 13. And finally, the Lord said, learn that kind and humble is the heart I am. Is this the way to reach to the salvation? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, to me, humility is the ultimate goal. And I love that idea that to become more humble and more questioning and more teachable makes me feel like I'm a stronger person. It's paradoxical, but at the same time, I do subscribe to that idea. I'm not sure that I have ever placed that within my work, but that's a philosophical truth for me.
We can see in Inferno that the sound and the performance are fresh and clear. We'd say quite different from all your previous works. So the final result, is it what you had in mind all the time, even approximately, or still leaves you the feeling of the unfulfilled after release? Infernal took quite a long time to finish, and it began with some demos and some ideas. And I had the ideas around for a while, and I, I wrote the words and perfected the words and examined everything. And then I sent the demos to the band members, and we, about a year later, got together in a studio for 10 days, and we recorded backing tracks of everything. And then I took those tracks and spent a couple months perfecting them and adding additional overdubs, adding the vocals. Shortly thereafter, as the album was starting to take shape, I realized there were perhaps moments that were missing or moments that were maybe a little bit too long that I could make edits of. I learned a lot throughout this process of making this album. So did it turn out the way that I thought it would? I'm not sure that I knew how it would, but do I think it turned out the way it should? Yes, I would say that the album did urge me throughout its creation to find its shape. And I think the shape that I found for the album was very much dictated by what the music was seeming to tell me it wanted. I do feel that this is a case where it says the song is discovered by Fido Xavier. And I do think that in this case, I was trying to discover and decipher this album as it was presented to me in whatever unconscious, subconscious realm that motivates and manifests my music. So did it turn out the way I wanted it to? I think it probably did. There are certain albums I've made that I'm very pleased with and other ones that maybe got away from me and, and I'm not as pleased with them. And so I would say this is one of the ones I, I can stand behind. So absolutely. The production of the album really seems to override the stars in our opinion. The clarity of the instruments, the harmonious bonding of the voices, the tight sound of the whole delivers to us an album that hides several hours of hard work and passion. Where did the production take place and how many producers evolved in? Well, thank you for that. That's nice to hear. I'm glad that this album seems to bump up the quality a bit. That's a, a rewarding comment to hear. The album was recorded in various studios and began with my regular producer, Gabriel Moffat, and he and my whole band were camped out for, as I said, 10 days in a studio, and we had the opportunity to try things out, try things a different way. Gabe is always there overseeing the takes that we're doing and making sure for quality control. But what happened after we got the shape of the album we were booked to perform in Canada at Terra Incognita Festival. And when we were preparing for that, we started to play some of the music from Infernal and some of the pieces changed a bit, which required me to then undertake additional sessions to change out some of the pieces. There were also a couple songs that maybe hadn't worked out the way that I had hoped they would and they were jettisoned from the album and I needed to replace them with something. So there were a couple songs that were recorded in separate studios. I then had an experience where I was finishing up vocals. And so I went to a studio in Los Angeles called Kitten Robot and was working with an, an engineer producer named Paul Russler. He really helped me figure out a lot of the problems I was having with the vocals. And that was a huge help to finishing up the album, which was then mixed by Gabriel and that's kind of our standard methodology. And so we definitely looked for a lot of ways to make this album warmer sounding and the production to be more transparent and not quite as hyped and aggressive. So I'm, I'm pleased with the way it turned out. Considering the creation of the songs, judging by the complexity, how did the composition take place? In conclusion, did your original idea collapsed upward over the years, meaning that inspiration got shared to more contributors? Well, the conception of the album was born out of knowing that I had the first two parts and people were expecting the third part. And I had some ruminations, I had some considerations that had come into existence, demos that seemed like they could be the third part. And in fact, side three, the order of protection, a lot of the themes on that were written shortly after Doomsday Afternoon in 2007. 
like the song Cast Out in Cold, Eternal, and All of Side 3 became this one long song that I thought might be one half of the album. And I had written an additional piece that would have been the other half of the album, but that piece didn't end up seeming to be genuinely part of the trilogy. It just seemed like music I had written that I could say it was part of the trilogy, but it, it wasn't really. So once I had that first half and I jettisoned the second half, I was looking for what could come in to fill in the blanks. And that's when I realized that our band had been performing live for a couple of years, the pieces from Doomsday Afternoon and The Great Leap. And in those performances, we had changed a lot of the music. So I thought, well, what if I go to those aspects of the band that had taken some of the Doomsday Afternoon songs and made changes and differences in the arrangements and pulled some of those elements and wrote new songs around the band-generated ideas? And part of what was important to me was to be in the same musical universe as The Great Leap and Doomsday Afternoon. So I wanted to make sure that the songs seemed like they were part of the same project. I wasn't trying to copy the songs or make direct sequels, but that did end up happening a little bit. So the idea was there, and then, as is always the case, when you bring in the other musicians, they will put their mark on it, they will have their new approach to it, but I would not say that anyone ever necessarily rewrote something. But yes, certainly the involvement of the producers and uh, the musicians expanded upon what was there in the demo. Uh, listening to Inferno leaves us with a more theatrical sense and feel. Have you ever thought of presenting the trilogy, say, in the form of opera rock? It definitely is a more theatrical presentation. I think when I was making Doomsday Afternoon, I knew it was part of a, a greater work, but I hadn't really thought of it in a theatrical way. But several years later, when we got to Infernal and had been performing a lot of these pieces from Doomsday, it probably then did creep in the concept of having a more rock opera quality. But I don't really think of myself as someone who can write or would want to write a rock opera like Tommy or Preservation Act 2 by The Kinks or The Land Lies on Broadway by Genesis. I, I think I, I wanted to have an album that was thematic and conceptual, but because it was organized as a four-sided double album, it, it definitely has the quality of a show, perhaps. That was not intentional. Have I thought of presenting it that way? I haven't really thought of presenting it that way because A, it would be quite long, but B, I like the music to stand for itself. I wouldn't really want to create characters and, and put it on as actual drama. I think it would seem a lot less if it were done that way. I think what leave the imagination to the audience to fill in a lot of blanks is what I always appreciated as a kid when listening to some of the more conceptual albums of Jethro Tull or Vandergraaf Generator or Genesis. You know, they would be mysterious enough that I could imagine a whole world rather than have it presented like Quadrophenia or Tommy or something like that. As your musical bar rising, do you feel that you have to change something from the previous albums of the trilogy? I do always feel that I have to change something from the previous album whenever I make a new album. And it's not so much an obligation, but as an artist, if you create something that you have enjoyed creating, you've absorbed the lesson or experienced the pleasure of, of creation, and so then you're looking to experience a new vista. So for me, absolutely, I always like to bring in some new element or return to a previous element, consider a different way of working with each new project. You've mixed up lots of music genres in this album. Passages from the most folk element to more fashionable passes or something that made us look close. Is this what you first had in mind or came afterwards? I think the way an album flows is an important consideration of creating album-oriented music. Obviously, when you make a single, when you make a song, you have the dynamics within the song, but when you have an album, it has a different ebb and flow. And particularly if you have a double album, you know, making Infernal as a double album was a bit of a joke because everyone always says that double albums are usually better as single albums if you take all the extra fluff off of them. 
So I thought that making a double album allows you to have that extra space to do some things that you might not normally have the time for or even the inclination to do. So yes, you get to slightly folkier things on one end or maybe perhaps slightly crazier things on the other end, more instrumental stuff that might not be as available if you were really trying to make a cohesive statement, a brisk statement. But at heart, songs for me are about something that people can hum and I try to make my music somewhat simple, even in its complexity. I always want people to be able to sing the songs in their mind or, or follow the musical passages. So the different genres would just be ways to express the songs the way that I am hearing them in my head. What first inspired you to write this multi-level, considering both lyrics and music, album, and generally this trilogy? What happened was I was making albums with my friend Richard, Bloody Rich Hutchins. He and I were essentially building albums from the drums and guitar or drums and bass or drums and keyboards up, and we would add the additional people. And we had made a couple albums, and I wasn't entirely satisfied with them. And after the fourth album, which was called 313, 313, which was essentially recorded in one day. We had exhausted all the music that we had, and so it was time to write. So I went back to New York. I live in Los Angeles now, and, and I knew Rich from when I lived in New York. So I would make trips back to New York with some little demos, and Rich and I would meet for a day or two each time I would come back in his uh, subterranean rehearsal space that often was very, very, very cold. And we would just work on various songs, and it turned out that we had a, a lot more music than, than one single album. And as the music was growing, it turned out that there were sort of two different strands happening simultaneously. One was shorter, sort of rockier songs, and one was this longer, more grandiose piece that could become a song cycle. So when it came time for us to record this, and we again did like a 10-day studio lock-in, where we recorded all of it at the same time. We had recorded all of The Great Leap and all of Doomsday Afternoon in terms of drums and whatever instrument I was playing, whether that was piano or guitar. So we had this stuff, and I realized I was going to split it into two parts. The first part would be earthier, rockier, more transparent, and more direct. And the second part would be very much oblique, more uh, Baroque. It would include orchestral instruments, and I really wanted that one to be more of a real examination of, of a long piece. So once that was done, I realized I had part A and part B, and I thought, well, the subject matter that I seem to be hinting at is left on a bit of a cliffhanger, so there should undoubtedly be part three. And when one is considering something like a trilogy, it's very self-consciously pretentious undertaking. So. I liked that idea because I think a lot of my music is very humorous, and I think people believe that I'm very serious in some regards that I may not be quite as serious. So it was rewarding to me to think like, oh, I'm going to make this into a trilogy because it was both ridiculous as well as a fun idea for a project. And then ultimately, I made those two albums, and people liked Doomsday Afternoon a lot of conversation about, you know, where's the third part of the trilogy. I made a couple of other albums and have done a lot of recording that was not the third part of the trilogy. So when it came time to actually make the third part of the trilogy, by that point in time, I was sort of seduced by the first two albums into a way of thinking. And the subject matter came fairly quickly and easily. And with the exception of having to figure out what the end would be, it all just appeared naturally. So that was the process of making those. I did not undertake it at the beginning, but it grew from its organic process. The sound of the guitars is a point of reference. It is bulky and so clear that they blend harmoniously with the robust rhythmic part, bass and drums. Where did their recording take place? If you're meaning the lead guitar, that would be Gabriel Moffat, and we recorded that either at his house or my house, or in some cases at, at the studio. All the rhythm guitar that he played would have been played in those original 10 days when we were tracking with the band. And there was additional guitar that I played a little bit of in certain cases. But generally, I would say it was maybe 50% overdubbed and 50% from the original sessions, 
and the lead guitar moments were mostly done with great consideration because I'm somewhat prejudiced against the electric guitar. I find that very often the electric guitar can have a sound that's perhaps a little bit overwrought, perhaps a little bit, you know, something we've heard before so many times. So I was looking to limit the use of the electric guitar in certain cases and also try to find ways to have melodies played that were a little different from someone just kind of shredding or playing a rock blues riff. So I'm, I'm happy with the way the guitars turned out on this album. I, I, li- I like the parts a lot. Piano is not missing here. The cello, the violin, winds, and of course the synths. But they <coughs> sound quite different from previous works. Orchestration is, a complete, is in a completely different pattern. Was the bulk of the orchestration made by you or was it a more collective effort? Well, I think that there are people that I work with, for instance, Mark Shirkus and Johnny Unicorn, who play a lot of the keyboards. And when a keyboard player plays something, I definitely will appreciate what they offer, and that becomes a lot of the orchestration. I will sometimes have ideas that I'll ask them to play. Maybe I'll take their original idea and suggest a change of a note. They might then take that suggestion and then refine it in a different way so that it's not so much me asking them to play a certain thing, but I ask them to play a certain mood, and then they interpret that. There are definitely times when I have a melody line in my head that would stack up and become the orchestration. So I would say that I'm always present when the orchestration is occurring, and whether or not it's an idea that I generate or an idea that I pull out of someone else or or something that they offer that I might have a, a slight tweak on. So it all happens in, in service of the song and very often uh, spontaneously as we're, as we're listening through. So it might not be written out ahead of time or known ahead of time. So in terms of the orchestration on the album, it was a lot of fun to bring forth parts. And what I should say is, unfortunately, there were a lot of parts that people played that maybe didn't make it onto the album because as you try out lots of things, not everything is is going to make the final version of the album. So the orchestration is sometimes about not orchestrating uh, or, or knowing when to stop. That was the last question. Is there anything you'd like to add? Thank you for the interview. Thank you for your questions. I definitely enjoyed making this album, and I'm glad that you could see some spiritual questions being asked within it, uh, because I do think that music operates on a level below the surface, and we often communicate through music in ways that are beyond just the words, and so it's always nice to believe or imagine that my music can get into people's hearts and into their minds and cause them to think and also cause them to just experience that slice of a moment that I was experiencing when I was creating the piece. So music is a great way to communicate and not always in ways that we know what the message is, but we feel it on an intrinsic level. So thank you for that opportunity to think about different ways in which philosophical questions inform my way of working and or inform the music itself so here's hoping that the next album will allow me to explore the human condition in in a way that um, furthers the discussion so thank you